Thanks for joining us for this symposium. I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education Research Network. Lauren's mission is to fight lymphatic diseases through education, research, and advocacy. In order to win a fight, you first have to join it. So we ask, please become a supporting member of LEARN at lymphaticnetwork.org. And we hope you enjoy today's symposium. Thank you. We will go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Wei Chan, I'm uh, a plastic surgeon with specialty focus on lymphedema reconstruction, microsurgery, and super microsurgery. And I'm a clinical professor uh, at plastic surgery at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, without further ado, let's get started. All right, so uh, these are the sponsors, looks like, uh, who sponsored the LEARN Symposium series. Uh, so this would be made possible by them. So I have no disclosure. All right, uh, so this is a, a broad definition of lymphedema. Lymphedema is anatomic swelling and bulkiness caused by lymphatic dysfunction or injury. So note that I say swelling and bulkiness because lymphedema is not just fluid. In fact, even the name lymph, the term lymph edema, that is a misnomer and that's due to our earlier lack of understanding that lymphedema isn't just fluid. It could be solid disease compromised tissue and it's caused by lymphatic dysfunction or injury. So lymphatic dysfunction could be acquired dysfunction or it could be congenital dysfunction. And also, even though we most commonly hear about arm and like lymphedema, lymphedema really can affect just about any part of the body. Uh, there's no organ that doesn't have lymphatic system, even though earlier we said brain might be an exception. Brain doesn't have uh, lymphatics, but recently we found out that's not true. So any part of the body that has dysfunction lymphatic system will develop lymphedema. It could be head and neck, it could be arm, it could be chest, it could be breast, it could be abdomen, it could be genitalia, so on and so forth. So... Um, well, most of our audience are patients who suffer from lymphedema. So I'm going to gear my talk towards patients. If you are a lymphedema therapist, a lymphologist, or surgeons, uh, I'm happy to address your question. Uh, this talk isn't limited to patient-focused talk. Please feel free to ask me uh, uh, any question you want about lymphedema treatment towards the end of my talk. So. Uh, lymphedema starts out uh, relatively benign, and uh, if you're a patient of lymphedema, you know that lymphedema may progress, and uh, usually when it gets to this phase, when we see uh, the parts affected, whether it's a leg or arm, when the normal anatomic contour is lost, usually by this point, lymphedema is no longer just fluid. It's no longer just swelling. There's also a lot of abnormal fatty deposit related to lymphedema. We'll just call it uh, lymphedema fat or lipodystrophy. So by this point, there's a lot of lymphedema fat. And uh, since lymphedema is a chronic inflammatory condition, the inflammation continues and it lays down scars both underneath the skin and on the skin. Typically on the arm, we don't see it as obvious uh, as it's not as obvious in the arms just because arm is a more advantageous position. It's more elevated compared to the leg. But in the leg, we can really see severe manifestation of this chronic inflammation on the skin. And many calls that uh, uh, elephantiasis because the skin is now uh, severely compromised and fibrotic. And at that point, uh, the skin can spontaneously breaks down and a uh, patient may develop spontaneous infection because uh, uh, this natural barrier of infection is compromised. And not only that the skin is compromised, but the immune system is locally compromised in the lymphedema affected parts of the body. So uh, if the leg is affected by lymphedema, the lymphatic system, the immune system doesn't work well in the leg and therefore the uh, patient will start to see spontaneous infection or infection from very benign, uh, well otherwise benign uh, injury 
such as a bug bite or a small cut. So contrary to what you have been told and contrary to what many tech medical textbooks are saying, lymphedema is not and should not be a clinical diagnosis. We're working as quickly and as hard as we can to try to change this, to educate medical professionals, to change our medical textbooks to reflect this fact. Lymphedema should not be a clinical diagnosis. What does it mean, a clinical diagnosis? A clinical diagnosis means we don't perform any confirmatory test. We look at you, we look at uh, the swollen arm or leg, and we listen to your story or history. And then we say, hey, that sounds like and look like lymphedema. So you have lymphedema. So that's how we diagnose. Uh, that's what making a clinical diagnosis means. And if you look at modern medicine, we have a hard time coming up with other conditions that we diagnose clinically. Common cold and flu, I mean, that, that's one. Uh, we typically don't order additional tests to diagnose someone having a flu. But lymphedema is a condition that patients live with lifelong and need treatment lifelong. Or we perform surgery. So I think, well, it's not just, I think, we now have plenty of evidence to support this statement. Lymphedema should not be a clinical diagnosis. So um, for clinical diagnosis, what people usually look for on clinical ground are one, stemmer sign, and two, they measure the circumference. So this is a stemmer sign, and you can see uh, the skin being pinched. So that's actually a negative stemmer sign. If the skin can be pinched, uh, it's negative. And looks like this patient has probably has lymphedema in the right foot. And inability to pinch the skin is considered positive stemmer sign. And circumference measurement, the definition of lymphedema is at any given level, uh, if there is more than two centimeters of circumference differential, or if the volume, if the actual volume is measured that there's larger, 200, larger than 200 cc, volume differential is considered to be positive for lymphedema. But look at these conditions. These are the conditions that mimic lymphedema. These are conditions that cause swelling in the leg or swelling in the arm. So if the stemmer sign and a tape measure is all that you have in your toolbox and you're trying to rule out or rule in all of these other conditions. I don't think any clinician can confidently tell you that there's 100% certainty that a patient doesn't have these other conditions. So the diagnosis needs a confirmatory test. There are various confirmatory tests out there. Um, right now, I think the gold standard is endocinian grain lymphography. And there are various machines that can interpret, that can um, uh, you can use to perform endocinian grain lymphography or ICG lymphography. All of them will work, uh, it's not you don't have to use any particular one of them. So this test is performed by endosine, injecting endosinian green 0.25% ICG solution, very trace amount, 0.1 cc, into specific location. And I'm using uh, hand and feet as example because arms and leg lymphedema are much more common than other uh, lymphedema affecting other anatomic regions. So this is similar to lymphocentigraphy. <clears throat> um, the difference is that instead of injecting a radioactive isotope, which is what we do in lymphocentigraphy, technician 99, here we're injecting a fluorescent material or a fluorophore. That's what ICG is, it's non-radioactive. And this is what we can see uh, after injection. It gets picked up by our lymphatic system rapidly and it starts to move, starts to travel in lymph vessels. So um, this is what we call the immediate scan following injection. The immediate scan allows us to evaluate the pump function of the lymph vessels. 
and the flow velocity, the presence of obstruction, and whether there is abnormal distribution of lymph vessels. When there is early disease, um, when there's injury, and our body would try to, let's say after axillary lymph node dissection for breast cancer, there's lymphatic injury. Our body would try to repair the injury by sprouting uh, or rerouting the lymph flow. And so those rerouting or abnormal distribution, because we know where the lymph vessels are supposed to be. So when they don't follow those normal routes, we know that um, your body has taken a detour. Your lymphatic system has taken a detour. So this is what I mean, the lymphatic anatomy. This is from our study of, of the arms. Uh, you, can see, <clears throat> uh, you can see that uh, they're uh, in the dorsal aspect of the forearm, the lymph vessels are, are uh, fairly concentrated and uh, as are the volar side of the forearm. And the dorsal side and the volar side, as you migrate proximally, uh, they move both radially and honorally to join the volar lymph vessels. And once you get to the upper arm, uh, both groups, both the dorsal uh, lymph vessel group and the volar lymph group join together and they become the medial group. So there are very few lymph vessels on the outer aspect or the lateral aspect of the upper arm. There are some anatomic anomalies, occasionally we do see that. Uh, some patients have some backup drainage pathway on the lateral aspect, but most frequently this is the normal anatomy. So in the immediate scan, if a patient doesn't follow this pattern, then we know that probably something is wrong. So we also need to do a delay scan in six hours. And, um, and that's because uh, it takes time for for the lymph to flow. Uh, in normal lymphatic system, in general, in two to three minutes, we will see ICG travel from the hand to the armpit. But in patient with lymphedema, the flow is sluggish. It would take longer time. And also, uh, if you look at these three patterns, the splash, stardust, and diffuse pattern, these are what we call dermal backflow patterns. <clears throat> these are the reflux patterns and it takes time for reflux to develop. Uh, reflux patterns are, are abnormal patterns. These are the disease pattern. So the presence of disease pattern essentially diagnose lymphedema. Linear pattern is the normal pattern. Linear pattern is, is what we want to see. So this is what happened following injection. We inject in the skin and the ICG gets transported to deeper lymphatics or pre-collectors and eventually to the subfascial collectors. If there's an obstruction, then the lymph would take a detour, go to the adjacent collector, and that's seen as a splash pattern. And as a reflux more superficially, that's seen as a stardust pattern. And eventually uh, they reflux completely up to the dermal lymph lymphatics, the intradermal lymphatics and the subdermal lymphatics that's interpreted as a diffuse pattern. Uh, I won't go into this lymphographic staging, but uh, based on the types of pattern and the distribution of the dermal backflow pattern, we can determine the severity of lymphatic injury. Now there's all types of clinical staging system out there uh, that we hear a lot about ISL staging, International Society of Lymphology, Campisi staging developed by Dr. Campisi, uh, Chang staging developed by Professor Mingwei Chang, MD Anderson staging. Everybody who's treating lymphedema come up with a staging system and name after themselves. So all of those are clinical staging system. Clinical staging system are clinical. Um, they usually do correlate with severity of lymphatic injury, but they are not consistently correlating with the severity of lymphatic injury. So clinical staging simply reports what we see clinically. If there is a lot of swelling, if there is uh, skin fibrosis, if there is presence of lipodystrophy, then we stage the patient clinically based on what we see clinically. But lymphographic staging is the actual severity of lymphatic injury. So I wanna make that distinction. 
So lymphographic staging is much more relevant to us when, <clears throat> when we are deciding how we're going to treat this patient. For example, if you're treating, if you're a therapist, you're treating the patient with MLD, CDT, you're pushing the lymph. Someone with a 90% occlusion of their lymphatic system at the axilla will respond poorly when compared to someone who only has a 20% occlusion. So it's very helpful and very relevant to know the severity of lymphatic injury. Of course, there are other measurements. There's the, there's the circumference measurement, water displacement, 3D scanning. These are all volume-based methods. So we, we perform these measurements also, but um, when we interpret these data, we need to keep in mind that uh, all volume-based measurements are significantly affected by multiple variables, such as weather, activity, diet, uh, the degree of compression, how much compression, and uh, the presence or absence of solid disease or lipodystrophy. Bioimpedance is also a helpful adjunct. Notice that I'm saying it as an adjunct diagnostic test because um, contrary to what the manufacturers are saying, in our studies, it hasn't demonstrated sufficient sensitivity to be used as a diagnostic test. Uh, we found that the false negative is uh, significant. However, it's a great tracking test to find out how the patients are doing longitudinally. Are the patient able? Are the patient worsening or improving responding to, to your treatments? All right, so... Having performed all the studies, now we have a confirmed diagnosis. Not only that we have a confirmed diagnosis, we know the severity of injury. So now we need to decide, are we going to treat with surgery or therapy? Now, this is by itself a lecture, so I won't go into it. Uh, just know that both CDT and surgery are highly effective. So the way I look at it, instead of considering therapy as first-line treatment and surgery as second-line treatment, and only consider when therapy fails, I disagree with that approach. I think therapy and surgery are two equally effective treatments and should be considered equally. They are just different treatments with different pros and cons, different limitations and advantages. And usually the advantage of one is the disadvantage of the other. For example, the advantage of, of therapy is that it's completely non-invasive. Surgery is invasive. For therapy, if it doesn't work out, patients usually are not worse off. If when the surgery fails, patient is worse off and there are risks associated with surgery, there are complications that can happen. So, um, uh, for now, just know that both can be highly effective. So many things need to be taken into consideration when deciding, uh, should I get surgery or should I uh, manage with uh, lymphedema therapy? So we're going to move on. If we decided that we're going to go ahead with surgery, which procedure? So these are all the procedures that are currently available. Uh, going from the preventive LVA, LVA stands for lymphatical venular anastomosis, to the standard therapeutic LVA, to the vascularized lymph vessel transfer or transplant, to vascularized lymph node transfer, VLNT and VLVT, and to the liposuction, uh, a lot of you call it SAPL, um, and to the radical excision or the Charles procedure. So, this is in the order of going from being minimally invasive to maximally invasive. And in general, that is also the order of how we would like to offer the surgery to the patient. If the less invasive procedure can get the job done, we prefer to offer the least invasive procedure that would provide satisfactory treatment outcome. So to give you a sense of uh, how small, well, super microsurgery means uh, very small, tiny surgery. Uh, this slide will give you a perspective. So uh, femoral artery, eight millimeters, that's the median vessel size work done by vascular surgeon. And 
uh, left anterior descending artery, coronary arteries, 3.7 millimeters. That's the average vessel size work done by cardiac surgeon. Microsurgeon, two millimeters, deep and therapeutic artery. And in comparison, that's super microsurgery uh, put on the magnifying ga uh, glass for you. So that's a 0.1 millimeter venule in comparison to uh, other vessels in the body. Okay, uh, some people raised their hands and uh, I will get to your question towards the end. Uh, looks like I'm running a bit behind. I'm going to try to pick up the speed. Okay, so this is the algorithm. Again, uh, in the interest of time, I won't go into it, but the main point is that for every stage of the disease going from stage zero disease to early flu predominant disease, late flu predominance and late and solid predominant disease phase, fulminant disease, uh, there is a procedure that we can offer patients. And also these arrows represent hybrid treatment. Uh, for someone who already has solid predominant disease, we would perform debulking procedure first and then we go back and reconstruct. The bulking procedure doesn't directly reconstruct, and therefore we offer reconstructive procedure later on. So the key concept, as I said already, that we like to offer the minimally invasive procedure and, uh, and the least invasive procedure is the LVA. So we like to do the LVA whenever possible. So the advantage of LVA, in addition to the LVA being a highly effective, very powerful procedure, minimal invasive is also that it fails well. So we don't just consider how much the patient will benefit when the surgery is successful. We should also consider how well a procedure fails. Uh, where, where do we leave our patient if the surgery doesn't work out? Surgery is not exact science. But regardless of how good a surgeon you think you are, you can't promise outcome. You cannot say the patient, to the patient, I never fail. So we need to consider where do we leave our patient if the surgery doesn't work out. So the super micro LVA is, is to be distinguished from uh, the lymphovenous bypass uh, that was initially created in the 60s and 70s. So these are different. The uh, LVB created in the 60s and 70s, those are micro or even macro uh, lymphovenous connection. And they're usually done proximally and done using the deep lymphatics. Uh, those, um, back then, the surgeons observed inconsistent results. And now we know why. Uh, if, if we have time, I will go into it. But the key is to go small. The key is to go super microsurgical. And uh, by going small, we resolve the issues associated with the earlier procedure. So in general, patients with a lot of linear patterns are excellent candidate for LVA procedure. And when you see linear patterns on ICG, uh, that means patient has functioning healthy lymph vessels. So uh, the lymph vessels are the driving unit or the lymphangion if the lymph vessels are the driving unit of the lymph flow. And uh, the driving force come from uh, uh, the lymphatic smooth muscles. Here you can see how they contact the unit between two valves and small lymphatic Here you can see how the valves are So normal lymphatics. So this is also, it's a wide range is influenced by preload and that modulated by the So to perform LVA procedure, we need to uh, initially find the lymph vessels, and we do this by performing an ICG mapping lymphography. This is to be distinguished from the diagnostic lymphography that we perform for diagnosis. Mapping lymphography requires a lot more injections because we need to hit all lymphosomes in order to maximally visualize all available lymph vessels. 
And so linear patterns look like this. And these are all incredible, great targets for LVA. So once we know where the lymph vessels are, we still need to know where the veins are. So we visualize the veins using a vein finder, and then we can very precisely plan our incision. And so this is what the LVA's uh, completion of LVA look like. Uh, multiple small cuts, and these small incisions heal well. Uh, the scars are usually quite inconspicuous. And uh, the markings, the artwork on the skin, those are to show us what was done. So we have a record of what was done because the structures are microscopic, even if they're underneath the skin, but even if we are looking at them with naked eyes, we'll have a hard time seeing them. Uh, so this would be for the surgeons. If you're interested in, in our incision placement technique, you can uh, look up our study. This is a demonstration of a 0.3 millimeter lymph vessel connected to a 0.9 millimeter vessel uh, in an end to side configuration. You can see the, um, uh, the square on this yellow background. Each square represents a millimeter. So here the first step is to create a hole on the vein, a very control ripping of the vein. This is a 12-O suture. 12-O uh, suture is uh, basically invisible to naked eyes. In comparison, our hair is about 7-O or 8-O. So this is uh, very, very tiny sutures. And if this needle is lost during the surgery, you don't need to try to search for it because you won't find it. All right. So. Uh, here we're sewing uh, the two vessels, the lint vessels and the vein together, and we are performing it in a counterclockwise fashion. And by the way, this is uh, human hands performing this, not robotic hands. Usually, uh, whenever I give this talk, people ask me, um, have you tried using the robot? Uh, so I think that's clearly the future, but as of today, all the surgical robots are, are not as good as our hands. All right, so we will move on in the interest of time. So there are different ways to connect the lint vessels together for the surgeons in the audience. Um, super microsurgeons debate about which configuration is the best. Um, so people have strong opinions. In my opinion, uh, they are all relevant. So to debate one is better than the others, I, I think is a bit uh, pointless because even if you consider, let's say side to side is the best, you may not be able to perform a side to side anastomosis given the situation. So it's best to train ourselves, train the surgeon to be versatile, to be proficient with all the techniques. So before debating about which technique is the best, it's more relevant to think about are you going to have a favorable pressure gradient? Because the LVA would only work if you have a stronger, if you have, if your lymphatic pressure exceeds the venous pressure. If your venous pressure exceeds the lymphatic pressure, your LVA would fail. So um, again, for the surgeons in the audience, this is uh, my preference. Basically, when you have a favorable pressure gradient, when you have a tiny vein, you have a relatively larger lint vessel, anything will work. But still, side-to-side -side anastomosis is the best. But even if you do end-to-end, -end, it will still work. So when the pressure gradient is favorable, anything will work. However, when the pressure gradient is unfavorable, when vein is larger than the lint, then you need to do side-to-side -side or end-to-side. However, these are much more challenging, technically challenging than end-to-end. -end. Uh, this is when, if you perform an end-to-end -end anastomosis, it's not going to work. This is an example of uh, an end-to-side anastomosis. This is a double anastomosis, double LVA, two lymph vessels going to a single vein, end-to-end -end anastomosis right here, end-to-side anastomosis right here. And you will see blue lymph coming in. So naturally, both lymph vessels are draining 
rapidly. However, only one will get stained blue. So you won't see the flow in the lower lymph vessel. Look at this vein. There's no blood in the vein because it's been washed out and in what we call a washout sign. Okay, here's the lymph coming in. You'll notice the peristalsis, the basic peristalsis of the lymph vessel. Here's a second wave coming in. There's gonna be a third wave. Boom, right there. Another wave coming in. You can even see the residues in the lymph. Okay, um, I'm going to try to wrap this up in 10 minutes. <laughs> now you went even halfway through my talk. Sorry. So lympha is applying what we have learned from therapeutic LVA to lymphedema prevention. So this is offered to the patient at the time of lymphatic injury. Let's say uh, a patient with cervical cancer, uterine cancer, at the time of their pelvic lymph node dissection, we perform lympha. For a patient with breast cancer, at the time of their axillary lymph node dissection, we perform lympha to prevent lymphedema from happening. This is the classic lympha and that is performed in the armpit or at the site where injury takes place. I do it somewhat differently because of some concerns related to the classic lympha. I do the supramicrosurgical distally based lympha and for the arm that's performed in the elbow. Uh, for the leg, it's performed at the knee. And this is an outpatient procedure, very easy for the patient. It takes about an hour. And in this particular patient, we make two incisions, connect a bunch of them, including the, an octopus or squid LVA, and confirm that it's working. And here you can see two incisions and four connections. Outpatient procedure, patient woke up uh, having no pain because of how tiny and superficial the surgery uh, was and uh, the lymphedema was prevented. Uh, for the surgeons in the audience, if you want to start uh, trying to help lymphedema patient, you can uh, start training yourself uh, at home, particularly now uh, with COVID, uh, you might be spending more time at home. Get some chicken thigh from Costco or your local supermarket, and you can tease out these vessels and chicken thigh to practice super microsurgery. You just need to search for vessels. Most of the LVAs ranging from 0.1 to 0.6 millimeters, and you can find 0.1 to 0.6 millimeter blood vessels in every single chicken thigh. And uh, take some sutures and you can start practicing. And you'll say, hey, I don't have fancy microscope. Here's our paper if you wanna look it up. Uh, we call it a novel micro, super microsurgery training model, the chicken thigh. And this chicken thigh model is now uh, very popular. It's adopted by uh, uh, super microsurgeons around the world to train their trainees. Uh, if you say you don't have fancy super microsurgery instruments and microscope at home, well, of course, we don't expect you to. Uh, I don't either, but this is how I uh, can practice at home uh, using my phone. And guess what this is? This is a eyebrow tweezer set that I got from Amazon for 15 bucks. And they're actually quite good. Uh, this is how the uh, eyebrow tweezers compare to our Emmy super micro uh, super microsurgery instruments. You can see that they don't look that much different. And if you connect your phone to an external monitor, then uh, that's the luxury setup. This is the basic setup. Just use a uh, phone holder and you can practice uh, micro and super microsurgery at home. Um, all right, so when the linear pattern is absent, LVA is still possible. However, this is also when I start to consider lymph vessel transfer. This is what lymph node transfer looks like. There's a bump, doesn't look very good. This is what lymph vessel transfer looks like. Uh, obviously, it looks a lot better. It's flat. So uh, I think even if lymph node transfer works incredibly well, there's still the issue of us deforming the patient. Uh, that's definitely not restoring form and function, which is what, as a plastic surgeon we should always try to do. 
a quick review of the lymph node transfer. There are various uh, donor sites. Uh, the grown lymph node transfer uh, developed by Professor Hunchi Chen and Karen Becker. And the supraclavicular lymph node flop, again, uh, developed by Professor Hunchi Chen and David Chang out of Chicago. And under the chin by Professor Mingwei Chang. Uh, on the side of the chest by uh, Dr. Joseph Dian and from Momentum from uh, Alex, Dr. Alex Nguyen and a mesenteric lymph node transfer by uh, Dr. Roman Skoraki. And so these are the lymph node donor site from the groin, from under the chin, from uh, side of the chest, from above the collarbone, uh, from the omentum, and from uh, the small bowel. So uh, right now, lymph node transfer is much more popular in the US compared to all other techniques. However, in my practice, uh, I rarely perform lymph node transfer anymore. Uh, in situations that I used to perform lymph node transfer for, I now perform a lymph vessel transfer. And in my experience and based on my observation, lymph vessel transfer performed just the same way as lymph node transfer, but it's much more delicate and less invasive. Uh, we don't touch the lymph nodes at all. And this is our lymph vessel transfer technique the donor site is similar uh, to the groin lymph node transfer and to the lateral chest lymph node transfer. However, the dissection plane is different. The dissection plane is very superficial. And uh, you can see here, all the lymph nodes are left behind. We dissect either in this plane or in this plane. So um, uh, the flap is very, very thin. And in addition to the procedure working uh, just as well as lymph node transfer, it also has the secondary benefit of not creating uh, a large bump. So this is what it looks like. And when we look at this flap under the ICG, we see a lot of lymph vessels and it's a flat inset, flat uh, normal contour. Uh, this is what a patient looked like two weeks out. Uh, I took this from an online patient forum uh, this patient posted uh, prior to surgery, after surgery, only two weeks out, and you can see the reduction. Uh, another patient, another patient showing the result. And the surgeons in the audience, uh, if you're interested, you can look up our study. Uh, so based on our experience, we now rarely perform lymph node transfer. For patients with solid predominant disease, we perform uh, our special way of uh, lymphedema liposuction that we call a flying squirrel uh, lymphedema liposuction. We don't call it SAPL. Uh, most frequently, people don't remove skin, but we feel that it's important to remove. Uh, this is how much skin there is. So in our experience, Hematoma, seroma, skin necrosis, or at a bare minimum, irregular contour. So we recommend removing the skin when you see a positive flying squirrel sign because the hanging skin looks like the wings of flying squirrel. And in this patient, that ellipse right there is how much we remove. And that's how much we will remove. And once we remove the skin excess, yes, the trade-off is a long scar. However, uh, the surgery becomes safer and, and the arm and leg looks better. So uh, this is another patient with flying squirrel technique. You can see before and after. She was only three weeks out. The surgical tapes are still on her thigh. Uh, even a patient like this can still be treated instead of offering her Charles procedure. Try uh, our flying squirrel uh, uh, liposuction. So we say fibrosis all the time. This is what fibrosis looks like. It looks like cement underneath the skin. But we can take a leg looking like that to a leg looking like this. Uh, here she was still on the table. And this is, uh, I believe she was a few months out. And you can see the inflammation also improved. And that's because the uh, disease 
fibrotic inflammatory tissues were removed. Another patient, still another patient, another patient. Uh, I think here we went a little bit too far. We made her lymphedema leg smaller than her healthy leg. Uh, fortunately, she, she was okay with that. Uh, another patient. In this patient, not only the skin and the upper arm was removed, we also removed skin in the forearm. Here, we tried to hide the scar, but here you can see the scar a little bit right here. So following debulking procedure with our flying squirrel liposuction technique, we can then go back and perform either LVA or limb vessel transfer. So this is what we call hybrid reconstruction. So same patient here, here she was after liposuction and here you can see uh, we, after the lymph vessel transfer, pay attention to, to how tight the leg still looks. And now, here she was, two days out. Now Very happy. And this is how she looked like prior to liposuction. Lastly, is lymphedema curable? I've already said in the beginning. Yes, it is curable. Um, we reported the first case of cure in 2012. And since then, we've seen consistently seen cure of cases of lymphedema. It is true that we, majority of the patients, we are incapable of curing. Um, right now, we are looking into what's so special about this patient population. And I will share with you some of the preliminary findings. The key is to get treatment early. When the disease is severe, um, the patients don't respond. The patients don't respond to surgery well late in the case, but early when the patients come in early, there's a lot we can do. And here, you can hear from this patient. She was one year out after LVA and she has stopped wearing compression. You can barely see the LVA cut. My arm was tight from really the wrist all the way up, especially in here, it was very, very tight and hard. Um, and a very concerning. Um, at the time, and I was using different compression before none of it helped. Um, and then after the surgery, it's been soft and uh, really fine. I used to get pins and needles. I don't get any of that now. We don't just take the patient's word for it, uh, even though we love them. But we also confirmed the outcome using endosinine green lymphography. Remember, I, I mentioned uh, using ICG as tracking is equally important as using it for diagnosis. Here is how another patient looked prior to surgery with stardust pattern in the form. Here is how what she looked like two years out. You can see her right arm is healthy, left arm has lymphedema. The stardust pattern was almost completely resolved. I want to thank uh, Bill again, uh, Phyllis and Steve. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to help raise awareness. And I'm now ready for questions. All right, we have a lot of questions. Uh, so I will go through as many as I can while wow, there are 280 of you. Okay, first question from Donna. Hello, Donna. Uh, so uh, Donna said, I have had a vascularized lymph node transplant from myomentum to my left arm one and a half years ago. Do you recommend follow-up surgeries? So I recommend that, uh, well, it depends on your current condition. So uh, the omentum transfer is a very effective surgery. Whether it's not my preference, but it's uh, certainly a highly effective procedure and proposed as I said by Dr. Alex Nguyen, who's a, a very capable, highly skilled surgeon. I would suggest that you go back to your surgeon, find out what your current conditions are, and uh, to find out what other surgical options are possible. 
if your arm is still swollen, chances are there are still more uh, things that we can do. And also uh, remember that uh, lymphedema therapy is an option. Combining lymphedema therapy with surgery can uh, make surgery work a lot better. Okay, second question from, uh, uh, I'm gonna butcher your name, uh, Itesh Sham. Uh, what are the management options in case of a successfully done microvascular lymph node flap transfer, which is functioning functioning suboptimally after lymph node transfer? So uh, um, I'm assuming you're asking uh, following lymph node transfer, if the result is not satisfactory, uh, what can be done? So again, we need to find out where you are now. Uh, what's the condition of your lymphatic system? So uh, the first thing is to repeat the ICG lymphography to find out uh, if, there, if you had a baseline lymph ICG study prior to surgery, we can compare that to see how you are now compared to how you were prior to surgery. And then depends on how symptomatic you are and also currently, and your treatment goals. What are you looking to accomplish? Then we can make recommendation on, first of all, whether further surgery is recommended, and second, what would be the procedures? Um, question from Diane. Can you spell the two forms of testing with and without radioactive <laughs> agent? Okay, lymphocentrography, L-Y-M-S-C-I-N, T-I-G-R-A-P-H-Y. And ICG lymphography is Indocinin Green Lymphography. Indo, I-N-D-O, signing, C-Y-A-N-I-N-E. Green is green. Uh, lymphography, L-Y-M-P-H-O-G-R-A-P-H-Y. Okay, that was difficult. Uh, okay, anonymous attendee asked, uh, what would you suggest are my best options for success and hope for better functioning and less 24 seven garments and SLD and MLD therapy? Please, Dr. Chen, what could be done to help people like me wake up with hope instead of morning dread and another day full of lymphedema necessities so as I said, lymphedema therapy uh, is highly effective. Um, however, if you feel that you can't put up with the demands of lymphedema therapy, then you can consider surgery. That's one of the indication, in my opinion, to consider surgery. Despite the success of lymphedema therapy, if you feel that knowing yourself, you just can't put up with it, you can't adhere to the requirements for successful lymphedema therapy, then uh, you can consider surgery. Second question, um, Dr. Chen, help me understand why a surgeon would choose a lymph vessel transfer versus lymph node transfer. My understanding is a lymph node transfer has a seven to 10% chance of creating another area of lymph uh, seven to ten percent chance of creating another area of lymphedema. So that is incorrect. Uh, so lymph node transfer has a low risk of causing lymphedema at where the lymph nodes were harvested. Uh, as far as the incidence, that really depends on the surgeon. So, um, and by the way, I will share with you a less commonly talked about understanding in the surgical field. Usually when we quote a percentage, so let, let's just say there's a 10% chance of developing lymphedema after lymph node transfer. By the way, that's not true for all surgeons. So this is like generalizing. Uh, let's say uh, you go to a bad sushi restaurant and your conclusion is uh, the salmon roll is disgusting. So that is trying to generalize uh, 
uh, how sushi uh, salmon roll is based on an isolated, based on one sushi chef. So that applies to surgery. I think the key understanding here is that the same procedure in the hands of different surgeons, there are variations, and these, these are really not the same procedure. And the lymph vessel tr transfer is very uncommonly performed at this point um, around the world. There are only a few centers that are offering this procedure. So at least as of today, knock on the wood, we have not heard of, or I haven't seen it myself, an incidence of donor site lymphedema as a result of lymph vessel transfer. I am almost certain that it will eventually happen. Uh, but what can be said is that lymph vessel transfer is less invasive than lymph node transfer and causes less injury to, lymph, to the lymphatic system. Okay, second part of the question. I was told that lymph node transfer only has 30% chance of success in a very long recovery. Again, this goes back to what I just said. 30% uh, chance of success, I mean, that's way too low. Um, I'm not sure where you got that 30% number from, but uh, that's way too low. That's certainly not my experience. In my experience, lymph node transfer is highly effective. It has a very high success rate. Uh, two biggest drawbacks, two problems that I have with the technique is one, the risk of causing lymphedema at another part of the body, particularly in patients with primary lymphedema. And second, ugliness. We're creating a bump. We're, we're bringing more bulk to an area where the patient was already complaining about excessive bulk. Okay, another question. While waiting, is there a compression pump that could help divert the fluid to prevent stagnant fluid from turning into fibrotic in this area. So um, the compression pump is an area that we're actively investigating. We understand that uh, this is an area of controversy, even, even among therapists. Um, first of all, is the pump helpful? Second, is the pump causing injury? Third, even if the pump is helpful, what is the optimal pressure to use? All of these are unanswered questions. And um, so we are actively looking into it. Please stay tuned and we should have, we will announce our, our results uh, once they are ready. What I can say is that the pump is very promising. And um, I think based on our data today, it is a helpful adjunct to, um, to lymphedema therapy. Question from Wendy. Okay, I will go through as many of these as I can uh, until, until I need to get back to my clinic and I do have surgery coming up. Um, but I appreciate everybody's interest and I will try to answer as many questions as I can. Wendy asks, is surgery safe during active chemotherapy treatment? Uh, metastatic breast cancer with bone metastases. So it's not recommended that you undergo uh, surgery while you're undergoing chemotherapy. Um, so one, one thing at a time, focus on cancer treatment. And once the cancer treatment is concluded, then we can uh, start to uh, work on treating lymphedema. And in this case, uh, the reconstructive surgeon would need to have a discussion with the treating oncologist. The, the two specialists need to be on the same page because there are other oncologic consideration when we perform lymphatic reconstruction in patient with active disease. Okay, next question, uh, anonymous attendee. So if one is very overweight, we would have to lose weight to even consider surgery. So in, uh, well, that depends on how overweight we're talking about. Um, so, uh, the reconstructive procedures, most of them are dependent on healthy venous system. Uh, if you think about LVA, when the lymphatic system is work, not working, we are diverting the lymph flow into the venous system, hoping that the healthy functioning venous system can help drain the lymphatic system. 
in people who are uh, severely overweight, not only that their lymphatic system is not working, frequently their venous systems are not working either, particularly for lower extremity. So this is not a yes or no question. So it depends on whether we're talking about upper extremity or lower extremity and which procedures. Liposuction wouldn't be affected. However, uh, for liposuction procedure, once we start to approach 4,000, 5,000 cc of tissue removal, the procedure becomes very invasive and very stressful to our bodies. Um, so in general, in my practice, I would offer liposuction for patient up to body mass index of 40. When BMI is higher than 40, we know a lot of the tissues are healthy fat or physiologic fat. So there's lymphedema fat and physiologic healthy fat that will respond to uh, weight loss. So just to make the surgery safer and less stressful to the body, we ask the patient to lose weight. Okay, next question. Can you please repeat the second con for CDT versus surgery? Um, uh, okay, let me get back in my slides. Okay, here it is. The second con for CDT. All right, requiring lifelong adherence. So, um, as I said, CDT uh, is highly effective. However, it does require uh, your cooperation. It does require your commitment. You need to commit to uh, uh, a lifestyle uh, you need to commit to uh, using compression and doing proper exercises and skin care. And um, that may not be a con uh, for certain individuals, but I think for many of us, uh, when something becomes a lifelong commitment, it, it becomes demanding, uh, just like eating healthy and uh, regular exercises. It's pretty easy until we need to do it uh, forever then it becomes demanding. All right, next question. Uh, Linful GWG, Gorilla Warrior General uh, from Canada. Okay, my definition of cure would be helpful to know, please. Plus, uh, do I consider lymphedema a disease or simply a condition? So our definition of cure, so we're very strict and rigorous with our definition of cure. So there are two types of cures. One we call clinical cure. Uh, the other type we uh, define as lymphographic cure. So clinical cure are the patients who uh, no longer have any symptoms associated with lymphedema. That includes swelling, that includes uh, pain, tingling, discomfort, heaviness, rigidity, um, spontaneous infection, any symptom, symptoms related to lymphedema, now patients no longer experience them. And also, they stop wearing compression. They stop doing any form of non-surgical treatment to maintain their state. That's defined as clinical cure. Now, many patients with clinical cure, they continue to have detectable disease seen on ICG lymphography. And therefore, they're not a clinic. They're not a lymphographic cure, but they are clinically cured. For patients who have achieved lymphographic cure, are the ones who not only don't show any evidence of disease on clinical grounds. We also cannot detect any signs of disease with the best of what modern technology has to offer, which as of now is ICG lymphography. And do I consider lymphedema a disease or condition? I, I think that's artificial. Uh, I don't even know how you would define condition versus disease. It is a pathology. It is a pathologic condition. So um, uh, Joseph asks, how long does it take to do surgery and follow up? Well, it depends on the procedure and depends on the surgeon. Uh, for me, um, the flying squirrel lymphedema liposuction technique takes about three hours. Uh, lympha, the preventive LVA, takes about an hour. And uh, LVA takes uh, four to five hours, could be six hours, four to six hours. The lymph vessel transfer takes six to eight hours. 
And so that should give you an idea. Do I prefer SAPL? As I said, I don't call it SAPL. I call it uh, SAPL. It doesn't reflect what we do. We do our uh, fine squirrel liposuction. Do I prefer fine squirrel liposuction before lymph node transfer? And again, uh, lymph vessel transfer replaces lymph node transfer in my practice. So I, I rarely, uh, we rarely resort to lymph node transfer anymore. But I do de prefer debulking. I think that's what you're asking. I prefer debulking prior to reconstruction. And most frequently, debulking is performed with our flowing squirrel technique, and reconstruction is performed with lymph vessel transfer. Next question uh, from Judith. When can one find physicians, medical centers that offer di diagnosis, procedures, and therapy? You live in Philadelphia. When can one find? Well, you can find institutions that uh, are well versed uh, in diagnosis, procedures, and therapy. Right now, it's just um, unfortunately this time uh, they're not everywhere. Um, but there are certainly centers that are um, uh, have well trained professionals. Um, I can only speak for ourselves here at Cleveland Clinic. We have. Uh, a multidisciplinary service uh, with lymphologists, surgeons, oncologists, and therapists uh, to offer a comprehensive treatment program. And we definitely are, are happy to share our experience. If, if your local doctors or surgeons are interested in offering these procedures, and if, and if they don't know how to start we're happy to share our experience. There are many other non-medical things that the doctors need to know in order to get started, such as how to code for these procedures, how to build the insurance. The insurance tends to be very difficult when it comes to lymphedema surgery, how to deal with the insurance companies. Um, okay, Naomi, uh, any procedure an option for global advanced lymphedema with epidermal losis, bolus, bolosa. So, okay, so I'm assuming you're referring to advanced uh, situation when the inflammation, you now there's uh, cutaneous involvement. So um, again, we need to have the, all of the diagnostic information you're simply describing a skin manifestation, but what's the condition of the lymphatic system? Um, what's the consistency of the subcutaneous tissue? Is it completely fibrotic or are there still any healthy uh, adipose tissue? So in the most severe situation, when everything is completely fibrotic, Unfortunately, our option becomes radical excision or the Charles procedure. But that is a procedure we try to avoid, um, not because it's not effective. It's actually very effective. Charles procedure is very effective at treating fulminant lymphedema. However, it is a morbid and highly invasive procedure. So we try to avoid it whenever we can. Okay, uh, all right, she calls it epidermal lysis below, so the, that's uh, woman and skin involvement uh, from lymphedema. Next question, Kathy. Okay, all right, we still have 200 attendees, so we will keep going. How accessible is this surgery and how expensive does insurance cover this surgery? Uh, so th there's really all kinds of situation in terms of insurance coverage. Um, basically, overall, I'm seeing better and better uh, condition in terms of insurance coverage compared to, uh, say, 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was universal rejection. Right now, overall, I am seeing about 70% of the patients being covered. And that's another reason why we're doing this webinar right now. We need to raise awareness, raise education. The insurance is not frequently giving you and us a hard time because they don't know. They don't know that lymphedema is treatable. They don't know that lymphedema can even be cured. So uh, I'm sure there are uh, plenty of uh, healthcare professionals in our audience. So now they've heard of it. 
they will go back and read up on it, search the literature to find out what we already know. So um, the more we raise awareness, the more we will gradually change the situation. But as of today, we're seeing about 70% of the patient covered. How much do they cost? Well, as you know, every in any medical procedure treatment in US when they are not covered, they're very expensive. And it really depends on which procedure we're talking about. Uh, rest assured that all of the surgeons that I know, uh, we request to our institution that we want to, we're providing, we want to provide a service to our patient. We want to help our patient. So uh, we requested our institution to heavily discount these procedures to try to make them as affordable as is possible. After all, um, uh, if the hospital consistently lose money, in fact, they lose money in a relative sense because they're more profitable. There are many other treatments that are more profitable uh, than lymphedema treatment. So in a way, the hospitals already, uh, lymphedema treatment and surgery are not profitable, that I can tell you already. So um, I think the best thing to do is we need to continue to educate, raise awareness to get insurance company to recognize that these are highly effective treatments and they should cover uh, these procedures. Okay, question from uh, Uda. Um, is LVA effective when lymph nodes were removed due to cancer? Yes, it is. So lymph vessels may be intact, but major lymph nodes are missing. Yes, LVA, uh, can be highly effective, I mean, regardless of the cost of uh, lymphedema. Another question, anonymous attendees. In a patient who has chronic open non-healing wound after seroma of the breast and lymphedema of the arm, would you wait for the wound to heal or would you perform lymph node transfer? Uh, so it depends uh, if the lymphedema, it depends on the condition. If we judge that the lymphedema is interfering with the wound healing, then there would be a reason to intervene on lymphedema before the wound closed. However, if the wound is already improving and moving forward, and that means the lymphedema isn't cause, causing the non-healing wound, then we should wait for the wound to heal before we start to treat lymphedema. And I don't know whether lymph node transfer would be the most appropriate procedure. Um, in my hand, most likely, I wouldn't be performing lymph node transfer. As I said, that's, uh, for the most part, we don't use that procedure anymore. Uh, it would be LVA or lymph vessel transfer. Another anonymous attendee, we had a patient that developed lymphedema after sentinel no excision. Do you predict if a patient will develop lymphedema after sentinel no biopsy? Uh, yes, provided that we perform ICG lymphography prior to lymph node surgery. So we see not uncommonly uh, in general population that people have lymphatic defect but without symptoms. So let's say a patient having asymptomatic lymphatic defect undergoes sentinel lymph node uh, dissection. This patient will very likely develop lymphedema because this patient probably would develop lymphedema even without surgery. And uh, now after surgery, everybody starts to label this patient as having acquired lymphedema, but this patient actually had congenital lymphedema. The sentinel lymph node procedure only exacerbated and possibly triggered the onset of lymphedema, but not the main cause. So uh, that's another area of research. At this time, uh, this asymptomatic lymphatic defect isn't well recognized by lymphedema professionals. So again, uh, why education is important. Uh, Carson, um, do you follow up surgical patient with ICG lymphography? Yes, we do. In fact, we publish our protocol, uh, I think five, six years ago. How often? Uh, three months following surgery, then six months, then one year, and then once a year. 
let's see. We still have 180 of you on. Uh, all right, so, and I can still keep going. Uh, there are 84 questions. I will go through as many of them as I can. Um, uh, okay, uh, I had cervical lymph node removal over 10 years ago, developed lymphedema three to four years later, now struggling. How do I find out if I'm a candidate for LVH surgery? So as I said, the first step is to uh, get the ICG lymphography. So identify an experienced ICG lymphographer in your area. Um, and uh, usually if there's sufficient amount of linear pattern, then you are a candidate. If you have a lot of linear pattern, you're a great candidate. Uh, if you, even if you don't have any linear pattern, as I said, this is when we start to consider lymph vessel transfer. However, LVA can still be performed. It's just that um, when there is no linear pattern, both procedures should be considered. Okay, question from Gail. Um, okay, you perform a lipectomy debulking suction on, oh, you're, my patient, hello Gail, great to see you here. Um, so I, I performed, uh, so I probably performed the flying squirrel uh, procedure in your arm in 2015. Can you be considered for additional procedure? Yes, certainly, as I said. Um, so you don't have to. Uh, so um, liposuction isn't a curative procedure, isn't a reconstructive procedure, it's a debulking procedure. You certainly can, you are a candidate for further reconstruction. However, it's optional. If you have no problem uh, with wearing compression garment, continue to work with your therapist, you don't necessarily need more surgery. Uh, think of liposuction as resetting your condition. It resets the condition back to a time when there was minimal or no lipodystrophy. Question from Joyce. I have had uh, lymphatic bypass surgery five years ago with moderate results. Would I be still be a candidate for lymph vessel transfer? Yes. In fact, um, you may be a candidate for repeat LVA or lymph vessel transfer or lymph node transfer. So which one to go with depends on how you are today. The first thing to do is to, um, uh, to find out how your lymphatic system is on ICG lymphography, and then uh, we can make a recommendation or the surgeons can make a recommendation. Okay, question from Jean. Um, why would I do lympha at elbow when through ICG imaging, we see that most people depending on surgery and sentinel still drain to the axilla and do not get lymphedema. 80% of the people don't get lymphedema. So lympha in the axilla makes sense by the elbow. In fact, if you uh, look into the technique axillary lympha, you will find that there are a lot of issues with axillary lympha. I'll just tell you a few. First of all, um, so we are questioning it. We are not um, refuting it at this point. Uh, so we are still studying both the axillary lympha and the elbow lympha. But the issues, the several issues that concern us for axillary lympha is one, uh, patients who underwent full dissection are the ones who had positive lymph nodes or those who had uh, cancer containing lymph nodes. How do we know and Axillary lympha is performed by rerouting the afferent lymph vessels into systemic circulation. How do we know the afferent lymph vessels were not involved in the cancer process? And we are diverting cancer into systemic circulation. Is that going to contribute to metastases? So that's the first concern. The second concern is um, when you look at the axillary lympha, very frequently, uh, we see the lympha being performed with a lymph vessel to vein significant size mismatch, meaning the vein used in the lympha is usually significantly larger than the lymph vessel. 
and that resulted in unfavorable pressure gradient, the vein having a much higher pressure than the limb uh, vessel. So uh, that results in retrograde flow and that results in thrombosis and shutdown of the LVA. That's the second issue. The third issue is many of these patients, great majority of these patients will undergo axillary radiation. And we all know how damaging radiation is to soft tissue. What do you think would happen to these delicate connections? Uh, there, it's a good likelihood that the LVA might be adversely affected. So as I said, we're not ready to refute the procedure. Uh, even at here at Cleveland Clinic, we do perform axillary lympha, but we are studying them. But And there are other issues that I don't have time to mention, but uh, the three issues that I mentioned, these are the questions that we ask ourselves, and these are our are, are concerns. And lympha at elbow completely negate those three concerns. Uh, but that's by itself a lecture. There's actually a lot more to be said, and I'm, I'm sorry to give you an incomplete uh, answer. Uh, there, there's a lot more. When the time is right, I'm assuming you're a healthcare professional. Love to discuss this further. Uh, um, uh, we have mostly a, a patient audience. I would love to discuss further about our research, but maybe in a different talk. All right, uh, Sarah, are you having success with insurance reimbursement for LVA for early stage lymphedema? As I said, overall about 70%, and it's never a straightforward process. This always involves a lot of back and forth with insurance. Um, but uh, we have success about 70% of the time. Patricia, in 2019, I had a neck dissection follow with chemo and radiation in the neck. I finished treatment in 2019, three months post-treatment, I developed neck lymphedema. It has gotten where it is difficult to swallow. The amount of swelling varies, but I have tightness around the area. It feels as if someone is trying to choke me. This is with me anytime I'm awake. Is there anything that can help me? I live in the middle of Tennessee and the doctors don't know what to do to help me. I went through lymphedema therapy that did little to help. I am doing massage, massage at home and it isn't helping. Okay, so um, the problem may be coming from two sources. One is obviously lymphedema could be uh, causing issue. The second is radiation induced contracture, which would have nothing to do with lymphedema. So uh, the first, issue is to determine uh, what causes what. If it's only lymphedema, lymphedema of head and neck in general has a favorable prognosis because head and neck is most frequently elevated and head and neck lymphedema responds to lymphedema therapy well. Um, we have much fewer head and neck lymphedema surgical patients just because lymphedema, head and neck lymphedema responds, responds so well to therapy. So as I said, the first thing to do is to find out whether you have severe uh, radiation induced uh, neck scar contracture. If you do have that, then the scar may need to be surgically released. And then the wound invariably springs open to a much larger wound. That wound will require reconstructive surgery. If you don't have that and your problem is all lymphedema, um, so head and neck lymphedema is a more specialized area in lymphedema therapy and also in lymphedema uh, surgery. I would suggest working with your therapist. Maybe your therapist um, is already a head and neck lymphedema, specialized head and neck lymphedema therapist. Maybe he or she isn't. If he or she isn't, maybe this person can help you refer to someone who is. Uh, so that's what I would recommend. Okay. Um, okay, I have 10 more minutes. Um, I'll try to uh, answer as much as I can. Um, Diane, does this expertise exist in Washington, DC? Um, uh, well, you can try Johns Hopkins. Um, 
I know uh, Dr. Justin Sachs uh, at, actually, sorry, he's no longer at Johns Hopkins. I know some that there are some surgeons at Johns Hopkins uh, performing lymphedema surgeons. That's um, what I would recommend uh, uh, who will be closest to you. Okay, Ahmed asked uh, uh, vascular lymph node transfer distal or proximal recipient area. Okay, so this must be a surgeon. Ahmed, you must be a, a lymphedema surgeon. So again, um, proximal and distal, this is a controversy. I, but that, I think as of today, it's less controversial now. Um, I think many lymphedema surgeons would, having tried putting the lymph nodes and lymph vessel everywhere, uh, proximal, distal, in between, uh, we found that they seem to all work, but when you place it more distally, it seemed to work better. Uh, when you place it proximally, it still works, but it, uh, the effect don't seem to be as rigorous. Um, so my recommendation is when it's lymph vessel transfer, when it's a flat patch of skin, you can place it anywhere without really deforming the patient. But when it's lymph node transfer, uh, that's when cosmesis is also relevant. And also there are certain situations that proximal transfer is advantageous. For example, patient having a tight axillary contracture scar, you need to release that scar. Then you need to resurface the axilla. That's when it would be wonderful to put your lymph node transfer or lymph vessel transfer in the axilla. Okay, Kate, uh, why does insurance not cover these procedures? Is there a way to get help with surgery? Why does insurance not cover these procedures? I, I think this question is similar to how come medical textbooks are 10 years out of date? Well, that's just the nature of how medical information gets disseminated. Um, so I was just notified that uh, uh, one of our studies got published last week. And um, so we had completed writing this, this paper, this article more than a year ago. And prior to that, uh, the study was wrapped up uh, about seven, eight months prior to that. And prior to that, we conducted a study for three years. And now it's finally published after all this time. And uh, I think in about five, six years, uh, the information in this article will probably make its ways uh, to medical textbooks. So we would be 10 years out. And insurance are not known to be at the forefront of medicine. So that's why. Uh, question from Jane again, with the flying squirrel, do the feet improve, do the feet improve is drainage reduced above with lipo and excision. So uh, the flying squirrel or liposuction doesn't directly improve drainage. However, by removing these lymphedema associated lipodystrophy, the patients are expected to respond to all treatment better. Patients are uh, expected to respond to MLD, to compression better because Previously, these lipodystrophy are impeding and are interfering with uh, effective treatment. So when you're compressing, instead of compressing the swelling, you're compressing on, on these solid fibrotic fat. So um, the answer is yes, following flying squirrel liposuction, that usually the patient would notice improved drainage and reduce weight, just overall increased comfort and uh, improve function. Okay, uh, question from Rijka. Do the patients have to wear compression garment after these procedures? Um, so we are not curing everybody. Patients who are cured, of course, they no longer need compression garment. In our recent study of our own LVA patient, we cured about 16% of the patient. That means majority of the patients are not cured. Uh, when they're not cured, they would still need to wear a compression garment. However, they might be able to wear the compression garment less. Uh, instead of wearing it continuously, they could wear it selectively. Instead of wearing class three garment, they could be wearing class two. 
um, instead of uh, needing to be on continuous antibiotic because the moment they stop antibiotic, they develop infection, they can stop taking antibiotic. So all of these are still significant improvements. Uh, so uh, helping the patient stop wearing compression garment, that's one of the main, many treatment goals. Judith, are these procedures effective for congenital lymphedema? Yes, it is. Kate, uh, I had lymph node transfer and LV bypass going on two years ago. Initially, there was good progress, but now I'm swollen again. Well, as I said, I, I think the best thing is to go back to the surgeon and ask uh, to find out what's happening. What is your current condition? Has the surgery failed? Um, or have you responded initially to surgery, but now the condition simply has progressed? What exactly is happening? Your surgeon would have the answers. Okay, question from Ahmed again. How, how could you locate lymph vessels in the diffuse pattern of ICG? So um, using ICG to navigate and to guide incision placement is uh, one simple way of doing the LVA, but that's not the only way of doing LVA. Uh, I, I think this discussion is best reserved for professional meeting, but to answer your question quickly right now, uh, there's one, there are two other ways uh, in this case to perform, still successfully perform LVA. One is what I call anatomic approach. The other is uh, what I call follow the vein approach. The anatomic approach is based on our anatomic knowledge. As I said, we know where these lymph vessels are supposed to be, particularly in patients with acquired lymphedema. We know where their vessels are. Their vessels might be disease compromised, but we know where they are. So with the anatomic knowledge, you can still place your incision and you can still find the lymph vessels. The other approach, follow the vein approach, is based on, again, our anatomic knowledge, knowing that the lymph vessels follow the vein. So you can map the veins and you plan your incisions based on where these small cutaneous vanules are, and you will still find lymph vessels. Okay, Kate asks, can more surgery be done? Uh, well, find out where you are now, uh, based on what procedures that were already performed, we can find out how we can uh, best help you. Uh, Anka, uh, well, thank you for your compliment. Kathy, will I be offering services back in Iowa again? Uh, well, I just arrived Cleveland. I, I've just been here for seven months. Probably won't be returning to Iowa soon. Um, I, I think, again, the best thing to do is to raise awareness and try to train more doctors, train more surgeons. Well, make your opinion heard by major medical center in Iowa, which would be University of Iowa, where I was at before. Let them know that Iowans need lymphedema treatment and they, they need lymphedema expertise at the University of Iowa. Uh, Susan asked for my opinion on Fibrilline BioBridge. Uh, so it's investigational. We hope that it works out just like we hope uh, Dr. Roxon's uh, medication works out. Uh, there are actually multiple groups that are working, and I, I think that's great that people are, are thinking outside the box, trying all kinds of different ways to help our lymphedema patients. Uh, I'm only a surgeon, so I, I can focus on um, my, uh, from surgical aspect, how we can help uh, lymphedema patients, but I, I think it, towards the end, the best approach is a multidisciplinary approach. We need all the experts to put their heads together so we can solve this problem. Um, Emrit, uh, for phlebo lymphedema, will you do venous ablation first and then one of the lymph... So we used to consider patients having venous insufficiency a contraindication to OVA. Not anymore. Uh, it depends on, um, it's very common to find at least mild venous insufficiency in patients with lymphedema. 
And uh, in our experience, LVA can still work in these patients. So we no longer uh, consider having venous insufficiency a contraindication. So we don't necessarily require a patient to get uh, vein ablation. Okay, Anka asks, um, do you use Garmin after LVA surgery? Yes, and if yes, when do you start? Right away, immediately. Uh, compression, this was also published, uh, I think four or five years ago. Um, this is completely proven. Following LVA surgery, immediate compression would make LVA even more effective. So uh, I do do compression after LVA. For those who are cured, we don't even remove compression garment at least until six months out following surgery. We need to have confirmation on all diagnostic tests that the patients have demonstrated reassuring improvement before we remove the compression garment. Okay, uh, I live in New York. Okay, this is from Joseph. Uh, and Dr. Diane is afraid to do surgery on you. So Dr. Diane uh, is uh, a very talented and highly skilled, well-respected surgeon in our field. If he is afraid to do surgery on you, there's probably a good reason. Uh, I would suggest openly ask him why, why is that? There has to be a rationale why he's afraid to do surgery. And it's probably um, out of the intention to, to do no harm. So as a surgeon, we need to safeguard your well-being. We need to, as I said, not only think about how surgery could help you, we also need to think about how surgery can hurt you. And we need to analyze the overall risk versus benefit. Is it a favorable ratio? And the risk, the benefit needs to be, needs to greatly outweigh the risk in order for us to recommend a surgery. So uh, as I said, I, I would recommend uh, having a discussion with Dr. Diane. Maria Duran, uh, what is the age limit to perform our surgery? There's no age limit. Uh, we treat patient newborn infants. We also treat uh, the most senior patient that I had was 80 something, 87, 88. Uh, so we treat everybody. Uh, what are the risks? It depends on the type of surgery. Uh, it's just difficult to, to talk about all the risks associated with each procedure. LVA, lymph vessel transfer, lymph node transfer, uh, flying squirrel liposuction, and Charles procedure. They're all different. Um, but as I said, rest assured that uh, for us to recommend surgery, benefits need to outweigh the risks. Okay, Pamela asked, um, okay, I have primary lymphedema in leg concentrated and feet. My therapist recommend I talk to you about the evaluation procedure. I'm in Philadelphia. Yes, we're happy to help you. Um, let us know and come in. We'll see what we can do. Okay. Lana, how often do you not need to have compression garments worn after surgery? So as I said, overall for an LVA patient in our recent study, it's 16%. But that's an overall number. I think if you stratify the patient based on severity, you would find that a lot more patient when they're in their early phase can be cured. Whereas patient in the fulminum phase, we were not curing anyone. So um, whether the patient can be cured uh, depends on the severity of disease. Okay, Patrice, is there a difference in outcomes between primary and secondary lymphedema patients? How many years out do you have data on the outcome? So the primary and secondary uh, so are not just two different entities. So primary lymphedema is not a single entity. To consider primary lymphedema, we really should consider how... So primary lymphedema is under development of lymphatic system, but how underdeveloped 
how hypoplastic is the lymphatic system? Is it 10%, is it 30%, 50%, 80%, 90%? In a patient who has 90% of the lymphatic system, only has a 10% deficiency, that patient will behave very similarly to someone with acquired or secondary lymphedema. So for primary, it depends on how uh, underdeveloped the patient's lymphatic system is. The more underdeveloped, the more challenging it is to treat. How many years out do you have data on the outcome? So we have lymph node transfer data since 2011. And we have LVA data since 2013. Uh, and uh, most of our results are published. And uh, if you're a healthcare professional, you would be able to find these studies. And even uh, if you're a regular patient, many of our re uh, studies are open access. You would still have access even if you're not a medical professional. Wow. I'm surprised we still have 140 patients. Um, and uh, I'm only halfway through the question. So I, I do need to wrap this up in five minutes. I appreciate your interest and we're happy to help you. If I don't get to your question, um, so I do a lot of these lectures. Um, please in, uh, look for these and I'm happy to answer your question next time. Or if you'd like to come in and see us, we're happy to help you. <coughs> okay, uh, Joseph, what else do I recommend? I have no problem traveling to Cleveland or Chicago. So um, it's not my intention to, to promote our practice. Uh, my, my goal today is to promote education, to raise awareness, so there are lymphedema surgeons across the country. We are one of them. Uh, we are one of the experienced uh, groups. There are certainly other experienced groups out there. You can uh, talk to your local lymphologist, lymphedema professionals. They should be able to help you. But if you want to come to us, we're happy to help you. Gabby, um, uh, okay, lymphedema in left leg over 20 years as a result of um, cancer. Uh, okay, you had lymph node transplant about 10 years ago by, by Dr. Chang. It helped, but I still have swelling and wear compression garment. Would there be any other option? So as I said, we need to find out where you are. Your current, the condition of, of your, the current condition of your lymphatic system. Uh, you could be a candidate for additional surgery, or you may choose to uh, continue with lymphedema therapy and continue to wear compression garment. Uh, you could be a candidate for LVA. You could be a candidate for further lymph vessel transfer. That's our preference. Or if you go to other surgeons, you could be a candidate for further lymph node transfer. Or maybe you're not a candidate for information that we don't have at this time. So if you're interested in further surgery, you can uh, uh, go to a lymphedema surgeon for evaluation. Okay, um, Michaela, uh, is microsurgery possible for patient with stardust lymph flow? Yes, most definitely. Also, what is early if I'm wearing compression garment and elevating whenever I can? Am I still a candidate for operation? So you are a candidate for surgery. As I said, regardless of severity, there's always a procedure we can offer to the patient. So all patients are candidate for surgery. Um, we just need to find out what would be the best surgery for the patient, with the exception for those that are simply just too heavy. For example, patient with BMI of 70s. Uh, for a patient with BMIs of 70s, undergoing surgery may raise, cause too much, poses too much danger to the patient that risk of surgery outweighs the benefit of the surgery. So. Uh, but in, in terms of treating lymphedema itself, there's always a procedure that we can offer, regardless of the severity of lymphatic injury. Okay, Jenna, how do I get properly assessed to confirm lymphedema and determine where surgery will help? 
I had a lymphocentigraphy performed last year and it came back negative. Have had ongoing swelling in feet. Okay. All right, all apps are normal. Okay, so I definitely recommend the next step being ICG lymphography. In comparison to ICG lymphography, lymphocentigraphy has a sens sensitivity of 60%. So ICG lymphography is significantly more sensitive than lymphocentigraphy. Um, so even if you had a negative uh, lymphocentigraphy, ICG lymphography may be able to diagnose you. However, I'm going to give you a bad news now. Uh, even ICG lymphography does not have 100% sensitivity. ICG lymphography can still be falsely negative. In that case, the gold standard, the absolute way to diagnose lymphedema is surgical exploration, microscopic surgical exploration. So we make a small cut and we directly assess the soft tissue, look at the lymph vessels under the microscope to see if the lymph vessels are injured. So we have seen cases like that when patient, uh, patients were behaving like classic lymphedema. However, they had negative lymphocentigraphy and they had negative ICG lymphography and we had to diagnose using diagnostic microscopy. But in most situations, we see a lot of cases of patients having negative lymphocentigraphy, but positive ICG lymphography. Okay, uh, question from Julie. I got lymphedema after total hip replacement with eight to 10 inch scar across my hip. I have bilateral leg lymphedema traveling upward to my genital and, and abdominal area. What do you recommend for me? First of all, your history is suggestive of not acquired lymphedema, but congenital lymphedema. Uh, the hip replacement, despite the size of the cut, uh, is typically not a mechanism that would cause lymphedema. And also it doesn't explain the genital and abdominal and contralateral leg lymphedema. So you most likely have primary lymphedema. Again, we cannot treat until we have diagnosis. We need to have a diagnosis. We need to also know the severity of lymphatic injury or underdevelopment, and then we can make a recommendation. Okay, we have Bobby, who's a therapist. As a therapist, which patients do we consider most to refer for these surgery? How do we help them navigate through their referral system to arrive at the appropriate surgeons? So um, I think as therapists, just like us, we don't uh, operate on everybody. We inform the patient their treatment options and we inform them that therapies, lymphedema therapy is just as effective as surgery. They're just different. They're different treatments. And everybody's different. Everybody has different uh, expectations, goals, tolerance for risks. And um, so uh, I, I think for therapists, now given, now you, uh, I think, have at least sufficient working knowledge about lymphedema surgery. You can talk to your patient uh, about these being equally effective pr uh, treatments, but with pros and cons and what appeal to them. Uh, if they appeal, uh, if surgery appeals to them, then uh, you can make referral. If the patient uh, are concerned about surgery, just because all the surgeries are uh, really quite new. Uh, these are cutting edge procedures, but cutting edge also mean that they're quite new. Uh, and also surgeons uh, disagree. There are controversies among surgeons and they don't feel comfortable undergoing uh, these procedures, then that would be a therapy patient. Okay, Cindy, um, a CRC patient, I'm not sure what CRC is, with METS, colorectal cancer, patient with METS to soft tissue of left hip and thigh, left leg is swollen and hard, lymphedema, dock and moffat cancer, won't touch me, using compression hose as well as flexi touch pump, um, am I a candidate for lymphedema liposuction and possible surgery? Uh, as I said, every patient 
for every patient, regardless of their lymphedema severity, there is a surgical procedure that can be offered to the patient. Uh, the question is not whether there is a surgery or not. The question is whether surgery is what the patient would want, whether surgery would achieve what the patient is set out to achieve, whether surgery would match, provide you results that would match your expectation. So are you a candidate? You're definitely a candidate for surgery. I can't tell you what procedure you are a candidate for, but I can tell you more than likely you are a candidate for surgery. Unless, uh, as I said, that the, the few exceptions of uh, excessively high BMI, uh, but for those patients, they're, they're not a candidate, not because they're not a candidate for lymphedema surgery, but because undergoing general anesthesia is such, poses such high a risk for them. Um, okay, um, is surgical procedure covered by most health insurance? plans, including medical, I said about 70% of the patient cover. Deb Carson, uh, what is surgery option if I had two C-section and possible future C-section in this wrapping? So C-section really doesn't affect uh, these procedures that we discussed. Okay, Marlene, um, no, that looks like French. I can't read French, sorry. Um, okay, uh, question from Jen. Uh, you spoke of the value of early intervention. Is there a length of time of lymphedema presence after which you would not consider surgery? How likely is that a patient would... Uh, okay, the question is incomplete. Okay, so the severity of diseases yes, in general, correlate with the duration of disease, but not always. We've seen patients who's had lymphedema for 20 years, but still had early disease. So when I say early or late, I'm referring to the actual disease severity, not just duration of disease. So we won't know the disease severity until we perform endocrine grain lymphography. Okay. Um, okay, another patient of mine here. Uh, I have scheduled ICG at Cleveland Clinic this coming Friday, August 7th. Okay, well, we look forward to seeing you. Okay, I'm excited to hear from you that lymphedema is curable. I'm looking forward to meeting you. Oh, okay. All right, thank you for your compliment. Uh, Cindy. Uh, okay, so you had... Uh, lost function in your leg and you have pain despite uh, lyric glass and Volta and using the pain pump. Uh, so again, I'm getting a lot of questions asking what I would recommend. Uh, I really can't, cannot recommend without knowing your individual situation with additional tests. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't give you a satisfactory answer here, but as I said, just about all lymphedema patients across all disease severity stages, uh, there are treatments available unless we deem that uh, putting the patient under poses more uh, risks, danger to the patient. Um, all right, so I do need to uh, get back to my patients in the clinic uh, now. Um, I'm sorry, I can't get through all the questions. Looks like I'm only two thirds uh, through all the questions. And uh, I understand that many of you are desperate for information. And um, there are many of us lymphedema surgeons and lymphedema therapists, lymphedema professionals who understand this issue and we are doing our best to try to educate, raise awareness. And, uh, and we also understand many of you perceive that doctors don't know a lot about lymphedema. And uh, I think as a generalized statement, that is true. However, that is rapidly changing. Uh, the fact that this general lack of awareness and lack of training in lymphedema care 
among physicians is now a well-recognized problem. And many medical societies are working on this, this particular issue. So rest assured that uh, this condition, the situation will get better. So uh, don't get despair, don't feel hopeless. We are here to help you. And there are many research studies going on. And based on what I'm seeing, and there are some studies that I, it's just impossible for me to go through them right now that I can not share with you all of them. But I can tell you based on what I've seen, I, I'm very hopeful and I'm very optimistic that uh, we will have a good control of this condition, just like we will have good control of COVID very soon. All right, I'd like to uh, thank you for your, uh, uh, for your interest and thank you for staying this long. And uh, thanks again uh, for Learn uh, Bill uh, for providing the platform. And I will see all of you in better lymphedema conference or in person soon.